Hello everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel, Homeopathic Super Sessions by Dr. Jagos. Today I'll be doing the part two of the fifth chapter of Carol Dunham, The Dose in Drug Proving. So Hanneman's instructions differed at different periods of his life. One essential idea was to take small doses at first and then to be increased until unequivocal symptoms are manifest themselves. So Dr. Hanneman said that Initially, you take a small dose and then you increase the dose until no new symptoms are appearing. That is unequivocal symptoms. In the last edition of Organon, Hanneman observed that the medical substance, when taken in the crude state, do not for a long time display the full extent of its virtues as they do when taken in higher dilution. So in the crude state, you do not get the detail or the symptoms of much in detail or much character symptoms Whereas as when are taken in the higher dilution. So more higher dilutions you take, you get more symptoms on the mental level, on the physical level, as compared to the, to the substance when you take in the crude state. The 30th dilution proved most advantageous when four to six globules were taken in the morning for several days. So Dr. Hanneman found out that with his vast experience of drug proving that the 30th dilution prove most advantages when four to six globules were taken in the morning for several days. So the 30th potency, four to six globules in the morning for several days should be taken in order to get a good symptom of the drug. He adds that, he adds that should the effects of such a dose be weak, it may be daily increased. So he says that on taking four to six globules in the morning for several days and still you do not get enough symptoms or the symptoms are weak and you do not get character symptoms, then you can go on, you can go, go on increasing the days. However, Dr. Hempel defers to the observation of Hanneman. In the Manorary Report of the Central Bureau, Homeopathic Review, Volume 1, page 575, he gives his view on this, on his deferment. So Dr. Hempel, he defers to the, of Dr. Hanneman's view by saying that the 30th dilution has to be given in every morning for a considerable number of days. In Dr. Hampton's report, the following or propositions were given. Drugs should not be proved with unattenuated substances. The middle and higher potencies do not produce reliable symptoms until the system has been previously saturated with massive doses of the original drug. So Dr. Hampton said that the middle and the higher potencies will not produce reliable symptoms until previously the system has been saturated with massive doses of the original drug. So this is quite opposite of what Dr. Hanneman was saying. Dr. Hanneman said that start with the small dose and then go over to the higher dose. But Dr. Hempel says that this is not so. First, you have to start with massive doses. Then only you go to the middle and the high potencies, which will produce reliable symptoms. In exceptional cases, a peculiar idiosyncrasy may enable the organism to develop symptoms from the higher potency. So he says in exceptional cases, if the person is idiosyncratic, then the person will develop symptoms of the higher potency. But it is unreliable to start the proving with this potency. So he says, but to start the proving with the high potencies will be unreliable until and unless in exceptional cases, the, per the person who's proving is idiosyncratic. By calling upon the original provers of the matter medica and the chronic disease, including the original, the original great prover of Dr. Hanneman himself. So if you would see the original provers of the matter medica and the chronic disease, including our great master, Dr. Hanneman, who also was the great original prover, it was found out that all his friends and provers strictly adhered to the directions and method. So whatever method Dr. Hanneman had advocated, his friends and his provers were strictly adherent to. Thus, out of 35 years of experience in drug proving, he sums up his observation to begin with the 30th dilution. So this value of 30th dilution, he hasn't come up within one day. It is only after his long experience of 35 years of drug proving, he has come to a conclusion that the 30th dilution should be used to start the drug proving. Dr. Hempel tells us that 
all the splendid provings of the original proof of the Mater Medica were made with massive doses of the strongest preparation, etc. From a few observations scattered through Henneman's writing, the following facts were as follows. Silver was proved by Dr. Henneman in the first trituration. The nitrate of silver was proved in the third trituration. So was carbovage in the third trituration. In the first publication of Natomure in 1830, Hanneman tells us that a great part of the proving was done with the 30th dilution. This was confirmed by the Austrian reproving also. Thus, in the view of all these facts, it is hardly correct to say, as Dr. Hempel does, that all provings of the original provers of a Metromedica were made with massive doses of the strongest preparations, etc. So, Hempel's view, what he was saying, was totally wrong or was totally contradictory as to what Hanneman was saying. And this is the proof given out here, even by the Austrian, by the Austrian uh, re reprovings also. Thus, the Austrian Union proves that the dilutions evoke trustworthy symptoms as a majority of the cases they were employed. So the Austrian provers, they said that whatever symptoms were obtained by the 30th potency, they were, trust they were trustworthy symptoms and they occurred in the majority of the provers. So now we can form a judgment on the propositions which were made by Dr. Hempel in his report. First, drugs should not be proved with attenuated substances. Now it shows that attenuations produce reliable and valuable symptoms. We submit that they should be used for the following reasons. So Dr. Hempel says that drugs should not be proved with attenuated substances. But, he, but furthermore, the propositions show that the attenuations produce reliable and valuable symptoms for the following reasons. Number one, attenuations have produced symptoms which have not been produced by massive doses and which have been confirmed by clinical experience. Some prove the susceptible action of dilution or small doses and not, and, and not that of massive doses of the root substance. Second, potencies do not produce reliable symptoms until the system has been previously saturated with massive doses of the root substance and, and the colloidy Massive doses render the system susceptible to the action of smaller quantities. Here we have seen that in repeated instances, symptoms which Hanneman and the Austrian provers regarded as, real, as reliable has resulted from potencies not preceded by massive doses, symptoms confirmed by other provings and also by clinical experience. So on what ground does Dr. Hempel question their reliability? Again, we have no conclusive evidence that massive doses as a rule render the system more sensitive to smaller doses. So whatever Dr. Hempel's proposition were, or his ideas were, or his concepts were, they were totally different and they were totally thrown out or they were totally squashed and only Dr. Hanneman's proposition was correct. It is said that the idiosyncrasy determines the action of potencies and their provings have this origin are not reliable. Here the word idiosyncrasy signifies an abnormal sensitivity to the drug action or the drug produces in the prover symptoms that occur in no other provers and bears no similarity to all the symptoms with others' experiences. So out here in idiosyncrasy, we say that these are those symptoms which are only exhibited by one or two provers and they are not exhibited by all the other provers. Such symptoms must be regarded as suspicious until verified by clinical experience. But most frequently, the word idiosyncrasy is synonymous with susceptibility. It implies an unusual acute but not abnormal sensibility to the action of the drug. So basically susceptibility is nothing but an, but it, but it is an acute or an unusually acute sensibility to the action of the drug. A prover who shows a marked susceptibility to the action of the drug is said to have an idiosyncrasy which, fav which favors its action. This susceptibility is similar to that which individuals exhibit from natural diseases some being prone to one kind of disease, others to another, and so on. So this type of susceptibility can be seen in different people who exhibit different natural disease. For example, one is prone to a certain kind of disease, maybe one is prone to recurrent URTIs, whereas another person is prone to recurrent urinary tract infections. So this, the susceptibility will vary. Just as one prover is specific to Tuja, another to Aconite, etc. So similarly out here, another example he gives or, or he compares it that one prover may be susceptible <coughs> to different drugs like Tuja, Aconite, etc. 
this susceptibility may be to the drug in general or to the or to the peculiar preparations of it thus the prover susceptibility varies with the drug and with the preparation so the susceptibility also varies with the drug and also the preparation it can be only learned by experiment with all preparations so therefore the prover susceptibility does the, we cannot make out the susceptibility in advance it is only by correct experimentation that we will have a clear idea about the susceptibility so the experiments should be done repeatedly and with honesty and with great care and precision in order to obtain a perfect proving we should bear in mind the following fallacies the use of higher dilutions will be confounded with the imagined symptoms with the real subjective symptoms the use of massive doses will produce chemical and mechanical symptoms by frequent repetition of provings one self and others and by clinical verification of the symptoms we can analyze the symptom correctly thus to conclude the following points can be established by induction and by direct experience in order to obtain an exhaustive proving we must first prove the drug in both dilutions and in massive doses so if you want to have to have a proper exhaustive proving you have to prove the drug in massive doses as well as in dilutions the proving should be commenced with dilutions and high dilutions be employed only when the prover is not susceptible to the action so you start off with a particular dilution and if symptoms are exhibited it is fine you do not proceed to the higher dilutions only when the prover is not susceptible to the lower dilutions the higher dilutions can be employed where a key or good susceptibility is found to exist great care must be taken to avoid blunting or perverting it so if the susceptibility is robust if the susceptibility is keen or the susceptibility is good you must take great care not to pervert or blunt the susceptibility therefore repeated experiments should be carried out with high potencies until no symptoms are obtained so if the susceptibility is good the susceptibility is robust then you can do experimentations not only once but repeatedly with higher potencies until no new symptoms are obtained then after a period of non medication the prover should the prover should lower potencies and then take small doses of the crude substance at repeated intervals finally another drug another long period of repose large dose of crude substance should be administered okay so therefore he says that when the susceptibility is good and when the symptoms are being exhibited properly there is no need to give high potencies and then he then is further says that after after that period a period of non medication should be there then again low potency should be given and then you have to give again those small doses of the fruit substances at repeated intervals again again then you have to give a period of again a non a non medication period should be there and again large dose of fruit substance should be administer so in this way you have to conduct the proving in this particular fashion hence a thorough proving of this fashion may requires year for its completion so in this fashion start off with a, with a potency if repeat if good if good response is there there is no need for high potency if no response is there high potency then be given then a period of non medication then you have you have to take low potencies then take the crude substance at i mean at repeated intervals again give a period of non medication and large dose of crude substance should be administered so this is the method which they have shown so hence a, th a thorough proving of this fashion may requires years for its completion so you can see how laborious this is to prove one drug in in the in the different doses however the great advantage is that it will be thorough and permanent and of good use to the practitioner so one of the greatest advantage of following this method is that the proving which will be done it will be permanent and it will be very useful for generation to generations or from years to years to the practitioner in proving dilutions as well as the massive doses a long period of time should be given to the testing of each of the preparation in order that the full effect may be seen in the production of the discretia etc so if you are proving with dilutions or massive doses or as well with massive doses the time period should be should be long enough in order to produce the discretia so in order to produce a discretia it has it takes a very very long time so you must not be in hurry to conclude the proving the greatest care should be exercised in verifying symptoms by repeated experiments in order that the imaginary symptoms on one hand and the chemical mega symptom on the other hand may be excluded so 
whatever symptoms the prover may, may think it is a, an image symptom or the symptoms which are chemical or mechanical, they have to be totally excluded. It has become a fashion of late to include all the pathogenesis and every sensation which occurred during the proving, proving without any verification. So it has been said that it has just become a fashion to include every and all the symptoms which have occurred without any verification. This may be called the pre-Raphaelite method of proving, which cannot be too strongly criticized. So pre-Raphaelite meaning the olden days of the proving in which they have taken all the symptoms, symptoms into consideration without any verification. So that's all for, for, for today as well as, as, as well as for this chapter. So I hope you liked my video. Please do subscribe to my channel, Homeopathy Super Sessions by Dr. Chavos. Thank you very much.